Andy, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Good morning. OK, it's uh, the morning after an excellent game of football at Old Trafford. Disappointing from Manchester United's perspective, but let's be realistic. Paris Saint-Germain are a better team than Manchester United. They always had that in them to come. I didn't expect them to be quite so dominant at the start of the game. And United were getting schooled for that first 25 minutes. But fair play, United came back into it. They played some really, really good football. And at the point where PSG, United equalised, the point where PSG went ahead, United were the better team. Fred is a talking point. He was lucky to stay on the pitch after he was booked in the first half for head contact against uh, Leandro Paredes. I interviewed Paredes in Lisbon in August. And I only wish he'd shown the same level of enthusiasm when I spoke to him. <laughs> but it was on the pitch at Old Trafford. But a Paredes actually means wall in Spanish. And uh, it was like talking to a wall when I spoke to him <laughs> in August. It was the day before the Champions League final. I did loads of research into him. I thought, you know, he's going to be, he's going to get up some chemistry. He's going to find it funny that I speak Spanish and what I know what my, what's going on here. But no, there was absolutely nothing there. But then a day later, I spoke to Ander Herrera and got a really good interview when he swore twice on the, the television station I was working for. Very good. Uh, Fred is a talking point, right? Um, the Manchester United fans in our life were like, you've got to ask Andy, what the hell was Solskjaer doing not taking him off? It was clear as day that he was going to get sent off. It was a sending off in slow motion was how uh, Tommy described it to us this morning. Do you agree? And is that like just one of those things that Solskjaer needs to get the experience of, get to grip with, or is it just a, a, a blind spot that he has? Well, I'll try and offer some insight because I totally get where everyone's coming from and I was saying exactly the same things last night. And even Oli Gunnar uh, admitted uh, that he should have made that change. From his perspective, and I know what's going on inside there, they didn't feel that they had a player who they could bring on for Fred with the pace um, to go up against an extremely fast PSG team. So the point was, and I asked, you know, why, why wasn't Matic brought on? And I felt that over five yards, Matic would keep being done. So looking at the bigger picture, this is a manager who feels that he still needs to strengthen, he still needs better players in there. Um, I can see the, the, that point of, of view, but that's wrapped and shrouding the emotion of, of disappointment and just wanting to scream at Fred because he is a good player, but he's been very frustrating in a couple of games recently, he was exceptionally poor against Arsenal. Then he's, he's been one of the best players in, in other big matches. But if you survive getting sent off as he did, then maybe you should be cute enough to know that if the referee's not got it in for you, then the PSG players have as well. And he went to ground on that challenge, which led to his second yellow card. And maybe that was harsh, but there was another challenge against Paredes, obviously, in the first half where... Fred was potentially lucky not to get a caution as well, but it just it just it killed the game in the same way that when Nani was sent off at Old Trafford against Real Madrid in 2013. Not quite as dramatic because it doesn't mean Manchester United are eliminated. But yeah, I take the point, and I think Oli Oli um, should have um, made the change. But that's viewed in hindsight. If Fred would have scored a, fr a screamer, then no one would have been saying that. But of course, he didn't. I'm not sure if Solskjaer is leaving him on to, to score a screamer at the end of the day. With Matic, though, it's an interesting point you make that he's going to get beaten over five yards. I imagine there's pretty much every Premier League team that you come up against at the moment is going to be of a similar-ish standard when it comes to pace. And if the Manny Matic isn't good enough because of his pace in Champions League level, there's probably going to be serious questions over his availability in big Premier League games as well. And I guess that points to the urgency that Manchester United still need to attack the transfer market with if that is the state of their midfield, in their view. Yeah, some good points. And maybe my point about Fred scoring a screamer was, was way of the mark because, of course, he, he doesn't score goals in, in football matches. I think PSG are, are faster than anything in the Premier mm. League and especially Mbappé. We saw that at Old Trafford uh, last year when he just stole ahead and scored the, the goal. And we saw it again with him and Neymar combining. He's just got them burners on his feet and he's just way, way too quick. But also their speed of passing. Matic isn't finished. He's had some very good games in 2020. 
in February and March before lockdown, he was one of the best players in the team. He can bring balance to the team, but there's not a lot left in the tank. And it does bring back to your point about strengthening uh, the team. Manchester United should not be feeling that there's a lack of options um, in central midfield. And midfield is is an issue because you've, you've almost got too many players, but the manager's not really struck on his preferred formation. He likes his 4 2 3 1. He's tried with a diamond and he's tried the, the 3 5 2 or 5 3 2, call it what you will. But there's not really a standout. This is Manchester United's best 11. And you have been able to say that with some of Manchester United's greatest sides. I spoke yesterday to Dennis Irwin, and Dennis doesn't do a lot of media, and that's his choice, but he speaks really well. And he said about the 94 team, he said, you knew who the 11 were. And he's right. And it changed a little bit by 99 because of injuries, because football had changed, because you needed far bigger squads. And that's still true. You couldn't be playing the same 11 now with the intensity of the season, with the two, the game weekend, midweek, weekend, midweek, right the way through, and even more intense over Christmas. But would United have been better with a, a world-class midfielder in there? Yeah, yeah, they would. I think that's a fair point. And it just shows Oli still wants to bring players in. And the players that he has brought in, I think they've done, overall, they've done pretty well. But he needs more time. Did Dennis Irwin give a sense of what he would pick as Manchester United's back four? Well, I spoke to Dennis in the day before the game. And I like him a lot. And he just doesn't do a lot of media. So I probably spoke to him less than all the lads in that treble winning team. And he's, he's a quiet man. He just likes to go and have a pint in the pub when the pubs are open and he thinks about football. And But he wasn't saying what his best current defence was. What he was saying was the role of fullback has changed completely from when he played. And that fullbacks are now expected to, to cross the ball all the time and be brilliant crosses of the ball. And the best example of that is probably Liverpool with the two world-class uh, fullbacks. Have Manchester United got them? Not really. Um, Wan Bissaka is a decent player. But he's not as good going forward as some of the best fullbacks in the world. And then you've got Alex Talese and Luke Shaw. They're both good players. Alex Talese has had a pretty decent month. But when you're playing against the absolute cream, then you're going to get caught out. And that's what happened against PSG. They're a better team than Manchester United. they one of the best teams in the world. They reached the Champions League final uh, in August. And Manchester United is still a team in, in transition. But when it's that game with four straight wins... The mood was good. You sort of think, OK, back at Old Trafford. But what does that even mean? There's, n there's no home advantage at the moment. United have won both the games in Paris and PSG have won both the games in Manchester with and without crowds. So it pushes on to the game in Leipzig next week. I said when I last spoke to you, I, thought, I still thought it'd be really difficult for Manchester United to qualify. And I still do. But I still think they will do. But it's going to be... It's going to take some swing from Leipzig to go from conceding five to beating Manchester United. But as we last night, United cannot go to such a good team as RB and try and contain them and go for a draw because we're heading for another Wolfsburg and going out of the Champions League in Germany if that happens. Yeah, the team Manchester United just aren't good enough at the moment to go and guarantee a draw. They don't, they don't just have the defensive solidity to be able to do that, do they? No, no, they don't at all. And I think that the coaches realise that. And they don't expect to win the league this year. That's reflected in the odds when you look at where Manchester United are in the league table. I do think there's been improvement. Um, with, with Leipzig, they were in a better position when they came to Old Trafford. Uh, obviously, they've been scouted extensively. And United see a team who've lost four games recently. A team who... I watched a bit of the game in Istanbul last night. It was a 4 3 -er. I mean, that could have gone United's way. But expecting other results to go your way, you're not going to be winning anything with that. It'd just be a shame United don't go through from their perspective, obviously, when they played so well in parts of the group. But that result in Istanbul a few weeks ago, that could end up being really, really costly because they could have gone to Istanbul and played and got a draw there if they hadn't been asleep. But they were asleep and they played dreadfully. That game was 3-all last night in the 85th minute. That's when Istanbul equalised yeah. and then RB um, score very late on to win it. Um, can we just talk about Van der Beek? Because there's, a, there's a, a, a view or a suspicion among supporters that 
he wasn't a, a Solskjaer signing per se, that he wasn't one of the ones that Solskjaer was banging the table for. He was one of those players that's on a transfer list that you acquire because you realise that it's a good bit of business and he will be a player who you get 40 appearances out of over the course of the season, but he may not be a starting player. He may not be the solution to what Solskjaer thought he wanted in midfield. Is that your sense, that he was bought to be a squad player? Or is it actually yeah. he is a Solskjaer player and he's just betting in? I've said it on air. I've said it on air when people were asking why he wasn't playing. He, he was brought to be a squad player. And that's not to do down squad players because they're going to be very, very important in a league and year when you've got Champions League um, football. What do you give them the same preference as bringing Jaden Sancho in? No, I mean, he's, he's a very good player who's still young, came from a good team. He had European experience. He was and is versatile he can play more forward i think he's done well in the last few weeks he looked really tired towards the end of the southampton game and that may be because he had a a big knock and he's still coming to terms with premier league football and i think it's unfair just to judge him straight away but obviously people will and i think he's played well and i think he'll play if he's going to play 40 games then great you're more than a squad player that's that's really important i can't see paul pogba playing 40 games um, this year, but there is that counter that 40 million you should be going straight into the first team. Really, in this day and age, I think you you're going into the into the first 16, but maybe not. You, you're not going into the first 11 because he'd done so well. He, he may have felt that he should have started, but I think that was a tactical decision rather than a slight against him. And playing McTominay and Fred in the two in front of the defence. To give you that platform, you know what they're going to give. And unfortunately, what Fred gave was one of the, the, the more unforgiving parts of his game where he, he gives the ball away a little bit too much. That stops him being a truly world-class player. But he does have the legs. And when he his head moved forward and brushed along the side of, of Paredes, I, I was thinking straight away, this is Brazil against Argentina here, but... It, it, it cost Manchester United and that's not good enough. Where are we at the moment in how the job security looks like from Solskjaer's perspective? Because they have a game in hand at the moment on most teams in the Premier League and if they were to win that, they'd be level on points with Chelsea and everything would be like, well, actually, wow, all of a sudden this, they've turned the season around. But if they go out of the Champions League next week, then there's also the opportunity for the, the vultures to start circling again. So where, where, what's the truth of, in your instinct about where the hierarchy views the Solskjaer era at the moment? Today is absolutely secure in his job. But as you say, lose against uh, West Ham, managed by David Moyes in a stadium where United have been really poor in recent seasons, go out of the Champions League, and it puts a totally different perspective on things and the pressure will build. Uh, the vultures will start picking off. A lot of fans will as well. And they're entitled to. Fans are absolutely entitled um, to their opinion. But as of today, uh, following that defeat, following four straight wins, ahead after that defeat in Istanbul, he's secure. I spoke to him um, for, for nine or ten minutes the other day. And he said, we're getting better. And I think United are getting better but they're not at PSG's level, and PSG won, won the game. The frustrating thing is United were playing well. Anthony Martial needed to take those chances. At that level, the Parisian against Paris, and then Edison Cavani, uh, who's been playing well, superb at Southampton, he tried that chip, and it, and it hit the crossbar. It's the fine margins, and he's going to be a very important player for United. It's, it's very unfortunate what went on with his social media the other day, which is going to likely lead to, to a ban, but they're the rules. And I think I'm, I'm told and have been for a month now that in training he's fantastic and the coaches hope that the younger players just take more and more from him. Just watch him, watch how he moves, watch everything about him. He's a world-class player. Uh, but... PSG are full of world-class players. They are better than Manchester United, and they prove that. Has Solskjaer ever been under any real pressure? Because it does seem that if you look at the back pages any morning after a Manchester United defeat, there will always be this perceived pressure on him. But has there actually legitimately been conversations happening within Old Trafford that we need to reconsider his position? To my knowledge, no. 
and I looked Ed Woodward in the eye a year ago when United had picked up 11 points from the first eight games. So even though this season started badly, United have still got four more points than at the same stage in the league last year. Now, this is the smallest of mercy because United started very poorly last year as well. But there's no appetite at all for continually sacking managers and they've got a plan and they want to see it through. But there's also got to be minimum requirements. That's my take on it, is if Manchester United finished eighth this year, then he's going to be um, under under serious pressure. There's got to be improvement. He needs a trophy, for example. Yeah. United have still got this huge wage bill and a lot of talented players. And the league table is really unpredictable this year. You're not getting Liverpool, who I think will win the league, running away with it. They're wobbling. Every team's wobbling. There's so many external factors, no fans, losing players to, to, to COVID, the intensity of the matches in the season. And that could work United's way. But if it doesn't, then after two years, it starts to get uh, dangerous for Ole Gunnar. And you know, on the um, business side, there's obviously an opportunity when the rest of the global economy is struggling the way it is to find some bargains in the transfer market. They, they didn't manage to do that in the summer with the Sancho deal, but that doesn't mean that at Christmas around Europe there aren't clubs who are looking at fire sales. Are Manchester United potential buyers in the January transfer window, do you think? If, if the targets became available or if we had a repeat of the Bruno situation last year where United were doing so badly, they, they had to bring someone in to change the season. And, and he did do. And, of course, fans will always say um, that they need more, more, more. And the clubs who have had fire sales, even Barcelona, who let four world-class players go for less than 10 million, uh, including Vidal, um, Rakitic, Luis Suarez, they're not suddenly miraculously flush with money. I think there's an economic reality for every club, including United. United are a better place than most, but... It costs over £4 million every time Royal Trafford's empty. Is there a queue of sponsors like there has been for any club? No, there's not. It's, it's more difficult. So United have, have, have got money, but I cannot see United. I could never see United signing Jadon Sancho, and I said that throughout, for the type of money that, that Dortmund wanted. And if United managed to get rid of some of the players who aren't featuring then that would change the situation. Because you've got players there on top, top money who aren't even playing. They've got no future at the club. And they've still got the bloated wage bill. Now, the only team with a bigger wage bill than United were Barcelona. They got rid of all the players, but they were getting rid of proven winners who'd won league titles. It's a bit harder for Manchester United to get rid of, of Marcus Rojo or Jesse Lingard. Just on that point of the Barcelona clear-out, Neymar was talking about that last night in the aftermath of the game. He was talking about Lionel Messi. He was saying that what I want most is to play with Lionel Messi again. For sure, we have to play together next year. They were in comments reported by ESPN last night. From your knowledge of Barcelona, do you see the two of them linking up at Paris Saint-Germain? Is that actually a, a likely scenario here? The Barcelona players love Neymar. They wanted him back. They expected him back. They didn't want Griezmann to come. And that was partly because Griezmann went on TV and did this stupid announcement saying, I'm not joining Barcelona. And it's all about money. And I don't think Barcelona are flush. They've got a new president coming in. So it's likely to be Joan Laporta. And when Laporta came in in, in 03, he came in with big ideas. He came in thinking, I'm bringing Beckham to Barcelona. That's what got him in. And he was a relative outsider. And I've known Laporta since he was a fan activist in 1998. And Beckham didn't come in the end, but they got Ronaldinho from Manchester United. And everybody was saying, where's the money come from? But if you're Barcelona in Catalonia, you've got an incredibly high standing and credit lines to all the banks who want to work with you. And that's how they got Ronaldinho. Could Barca bring Neymar back? I mean, that's the dream. But Barca fans want to buy into to dreams. And then the more probable... Thing, what you're saying is Messi going to PSG because he's been so unhappy at Barca, who are really struggling this season, who before the, the weekend's win against Osasuna were, were, were mid-table. Um, with Messi, I think he does want to go, 
But then I think his family are really happy in Barcelona. And there's all these factors. Um, you can almost see it being mapped out for him. Go to Manchester City, work with people you worked with before. And then as your levels decline, go to other groups, clubs in the City group, be it in, in Australia or, or New York. But I don't know what he wants. I'm just speculating there. I'm not privy to the conversations between him and his wife, who's very happy living overlooking the Mediterranean in Barcelona, even though her best friend, uh, Mrs. Suarez, has, has gone to live in Madrid. It is a different world from the uh, the reign of Manchester and um, the, the squally Irish Sea. Andy, great to have you with us this morning. Cheers. Thank you. Andy Mitten giving us some thoughts about uh, what happened last night. A um, bit more upbeat, I would have said, um, after a defeat, I guess, because Paris Saint-Germain are so good. 0879 180 180. We'd love to hear from you. Loads of comments coming in about that, and I'll get to them in just a moment.